top stories, Sir Kennedy paid tribute to the late Cicely Tyson. Public Works official explains rationale behind cutting up sections of the road. And Cabinet hears plans for COVID-19 training at the JNF Hospital. The details on these stories and more after the break. With our limits happy and free The skin you're in with no apology The one to seize the day Grab an LLB Live, love, be Through a lemon, lime, and bitters, live, love, be. In your formative years, we were there. When you got the good news and the bad, we were right there with you. Through all your great adventures, we were always right by your side. Now that life has thrown us a curveball, we are still here. And as we navigate this difficult period, the SKCCU will continue to be there for you and your family to help you through. We will assist you in safely and efficiently accessing your funds through our digital platforms, online banking, mobile banking, ATMs, and even our drive-through services. We can get through this together with responsible financial decisions by making food and medication a priority, practicing proper hygiene, maintaining social distancing, and constant prayer. We are here for you. We are still here. We will get through this together. SKCCU will continue to be your financial partner for life. Hello and welcome to the Zanazai Channel 5 Newscast. I'm Carla Berridge. Former Prime Minister Sir Kennedy Simmons has expressed his sadness on learning of the death of award-winning actress Cicely Tyson. Tyson, whose parents are from Nevis, passed away on Thursday at the age of 96. In an online post, Sir Kennedy was quoted as saying, saddened to hear of the passing of the legendary and iconic Hollywood actress Cicely Tyson. Cicely Tyson was born to Nevision parents and was extremely proud of her Nevision heritage. The post continued, quote, she was a very special guest of the St. Kitts and Nevis government at independent celebrations 1983. In 1989, she returned to the Federation, this time bringing Reverend Jesse Jackson in the aftermath of Hurricane Hugo. She was as proud of her heritage as we were of her. Rest in peace, Cicely Tyson. In an interview with CNN, the Tony and Emmy Award winner said her most important accomplishment happened in 2016 when President Barack Obama awarded her the Medal of Freedom. Chief Engineer at the Public Works Department, George Gilbert, shared some insight into why small sections of roads that were recently paved are sometimes cut open. He explained that it goes back to the placement of some utility lines which run underground. It is standard practice for utility companies to be notified before any major road renovation takes place. This affords the opportunity for them to upgrade their infrastructure where necessary. The St. Kitts Water Services Department in particular is a key partner in this process. Since the island main road rehabilitation project began in 2018, several older pipes have been replaced. While most of the underground pipes were relocated to one parallel to the road, some of them unavoidably still run across the road. Mr. Gilbert said that some pipes were impacted during the roadworks. In the process, the pipe apparently got broken on the ground, so it started leaking, and you realize the pipes are sometimes three, four feet below. So you don't see when you see it manifest itself on the surface, it would have spread over a large area. So that area has to be cut out, and the water department have to go in and change all those pipelines before we can go back in. The chief engineer added that after repairs are completed, there is a period of time that is allotted before the road is repaved. 
The allotted period of time is to ensure that there are no other damages in the immediate area that need addressing. Once officials are satisfied, the road is repaved. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris chaired a meeting of the Federal Cabinet on Monday where the National COVID-19 Task Force informed of the Federation's position with regards to the pandemic. Director General of the St. Kitts Nevis Information Service, Les Roy Williams, outlined the updates that were given during the post-Cabinet briefing. He noted that COVID-19 training will take place at the hospital. Apart from the customary update and statistics, the Chief Medical Officer informed the Cabinet of the vaccine procurement process, advised on the Federation's placement in the queue and the public education campaign needed to sensitize citizens on the need for vaccination. The Joseph Nathaniel France General Hospital expects to have the services of a consultant to give technical support and training regarding COVID-19 matters and certification. He said Cabinet was also advised of the Federation's crime statistics. The Commissioner of Police reported to the Cabinet that the crime statistics were still trending downwards, except for malicious damage to property, and that motorists should endeavor to be more conscious to avoid leaving valuables exposed in unattended vehicles. Mr. Williams also noted that the Minister with Responsibility for International Trade informed the Cabinet that the case brought by Belize against the Federation in the matter of sugar importation outside the CARICOM Caribbean Community Region has been withdrawn. And in other national news, in an effort to assist customers who are behind on their bills and may face disconnections, the St. Kitts Electricity Company Skellic will be offering a new feature to their deferred payment arrangements. Right now, the deferred payment plan allows persons to reduce the amount owed by paying on the monthly bill and the arrears in monthly installments. However, Skellex Corporate Communications Manager Patrice Harris told ZIZ News that starting next week, the company is adding a new option to make starting the payment plan easier. In order to apply for this deferred payment arrangement, they will have to make an initial deposit of anywhere between 20 and 50%. For this promotion that we're having commencing on February 1st, the customer gets to choose the deposit that they want to make. They get to choose the amount. We are not going to mandate that it should be 20, 30, 40, or 50%. This is another form of relief that we are providing to our customers to ensure that they remain up to date with their bills. She said this decision to begin disconnections is not sudden and customers who have owed large amounts have been repeatedly notified. Customers are not just going to wake up overnight and be without power. We have written letters to these customers in December. We sent out notices and final notices in this month. And we're doing our sensitization drive so that customers are aware that disconnections have commenced and that it is important for them to come into our office. So we are mindful of the financial hardship, and that is why we're offering this 14-day promotion where you can come in and choose your deposit amount. Ms. Harris says customers will have a maximum of three years to pay off the bill while remaining up to date with their current bill. The option to choose your initial payment will be offered from the 1st to the 14th of February. After the break, retired customs officers honored and 86th anniversary of the Buckles Uprising celebrated. Stay with us. Wanna get away? Now you can. Stop standing in long ATM lines to withdraw cash. Use your national debit or black cards to complete a wide variety of transactions at supermarkets, variety stores, gas stations, pharmacies, and more. Shop online at the most popular websites and stores for quality brands using your national debit or black cards. And take back your time to enjoy all the things that you love to do. Remember, instead of waiting in long ATM lines to withdraw cash, use your national bank cards today. National Bank, always here.
Welcome back. As part of activities to observe International Customs Day, the Customs and Excise Department held a Customs Officer Appreciation Ceremony at Customs Headquarters on Thursday. Five former Customs employees were awarded for their service to the department over the years. Public Relations Officer for the Customs Department, Kishma Griffin, the noted that the honorees have contributed greatly resort. to the department's success, hence the importance of the ceremony. The CED understands the importance of its human resource and as such felt it was imperative for us to honor our recently retired staff who would have added value to the department's output during these challenging times. Acting Comptroller of Customs Juma Butler said the Customs Department is eternally grateful for the work the honorees have put in over the years. And that's why we, we thought it only fitting that during this Customs Week that we show our appreciation. It is said often times that you, you give flowers to persons while they're yet still alive. And so while you're yet still alive, we want to let you know that the department have appreciated your work, your labor, your effort, your toil, not only to the department, but to the Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis as a whole. The recipients present to receive their awards were Clement Duport, Edwin Charles, and Trevor Henville. Kurt Liburd accepted on behalf of Patricia Liburd, and Devon Gums accepted on behalf of Janice Pemberton. The International Customs Day Week of Activities was held under the theme Bolstering Recovery, Renewal, and Resilience. The, sixth, the 86th anniversary of the 1935 Buckley's Uprising was commemorated with a ceremony on Thursday, hosted by the Nyabingi Theocracy Order, Church of His and Her Imperial Majesty at Buckley's Estate. On that day in 1935, Kane Cutters at Buckley's Estate asked the manager, E.D.B. Dobridge, for an increase in wages. Dobridge refused and the workers went on strike. Historian Earl Clark, who spoke at the ceremony, said the uprising was a historic event as, it, if, as its effects spread across the Caribbean into South America. The event, the uprising in 1935, caused um, changes to be incurred in, the, um, in these islands. Um, you had the formation, you have, you had the formation of um, trade unions the formation of um, political parties, you had the health system increased, and you had the education system increased, not only in St. Kitts, but throughout the Caribbean. So this was um, a momentous event in, um, which happened in St. Kitts. Glenroy Blanchett, who recently published the book The Truth About Robert Llewellyn Bradshaw, said the Federation's first national hero saw the significance of the Buckley's uprising and also paid tribute to them with the purchasing of the land for the people of St. Kitts. On the 31st of January 1975, when his administration um, took the sugar lands in the state for the people of this country, he had a symbolic ceremony here at this very Buckley's estate yard to recognize the importance of that bold initiative of taking the lands back from the plantation owners. And at that ceremony, he also paid tribute to, to the, the work, the efforts, the struggle that our people, the sacrifice that they made during the Buckley's uprising. The ceremony, which featured speeches, poems, and songs, recognized those persons who lost their lives or were injured during the uprising. It was guided by the theme, Taking a Stance and Honoring or Matter Sacrifice of 1935, the Buckley's Uprising. East Bastia resident and attorney at law Natasha Gray has embarked on an initiative to improve the literacy skills of the children in her community with the official launch of the East Bastia Book Club. In an interview with ZIZ News, Grace said the idea came to her through a conversation she had with teachers who said some children still have difficulty reading. On New Year's Day, I was having a discussion with some teachers and they were indicating that some children have some challenges as it relates to reading, even simple books. 
And as I heard that the Prime Minister was extending the duty-free concession, I said, let me take advantage of that opportunity and order some books and try to see if I could see. She said the club is aimed at children ages 4 to 16 years. To officially launch the club, Grace said she will be hosting a launch event on Saturday, 30th January at the Newtown Community Center. She spoke about what persons can expect when they attend the launch. The registration process starts at 1.45. Um, persons will be given name tags. They would be um, placed in an environment which makes them comfortable and want to read. Um, we would have a guest appearance by Infamous who would read for the children and also sing some songs for them. We want to make it exciting and fun and so I'm welcoming all children ages 4 to 16 from the East Bassia community. If there are children who are not from the community and they come, we welcome them as well because we want to make the nation a nation of readers. She encourages especially the teens to take advantage of this initiative because it is an opportunity for them to enhance their reading skills. Grace said persons interested in donating books to the club can contact her at 466-9839 or visit her office on Pond Road. And finally on the local scene, just days to go before the Emergence and Affirmation Summit organized by motivational speaker Vikish Pickering. A health and wellness component will be part of the event slated for January 31st. Andre Huey has more in this report. Persons who are concerned about their health and wellness may benefit from attending the Emergence and Affirmation Summit scheduled for January 31st at the Kuna Caribbean Conference Center in Portland. Convener of the summit, Vikish Pickering of V Creation, explained that though most of the speakers will be focusing their presentations on motivation and inspiration, one of the facilitators is an expert in fitness and wellness and would guide participants on the road to good health. One of the things that made it possible for me to pursue my purpose was my health. And uh, this improved greatly when I teamed up with my wellness coach, Davina, from Wellness with Davina B. Now, uh, this is very important to anybody pursuing their purpose and we have teamed up to offer you prizes on the day of the Emergence and Affirmation Summit so that we'll have a few lucky winners that will walk away with packages from Wellness with Davina B. Though the summit is being held at the Kuna Caribbean Conference Center, persons can also join virtually whether at home or abroad. Now, if you're unable to make it in person or if you're off island, you don't have to miss out. The Emergence and Affirmation Summit is available for viewing online. To register, you visit www.vicreation-inspire.com or you can call 765 6798 for more information. Meanwhile, Ms. Pickering outlined some prizes and giveaways that will be at the conference. Another great prize that I am very excited about is dinner for two from a private chef. So that's dinner at wherever you choose and you'll have your own private chef. How great is that? There's the cocktail that follows immediately, but I'm thinking it's not a cocktail. It's a farewell celebration, a farewell celebration to the old you. Because on the 31st of January, you are going to emerge a new person. There is going to be a shift. There is also a follow-up factor which ensures that you build momentum after you leave. We're not just going to shock you and leave you. We're going to help you build momentum. And that follow-up includes... 30 affirmations that will take you through February. There's also a weekly exercise for every week in February. And then at the end of it, there's a follow-up. The Emergence and Affirmation Summit is a one-day motivational event featuring presentations from various speakers and presenters. Ms. Pickering will be one of the keynote speakers. Coming up in regional news, Brazil vaccination rollout delayed across the country. The details when we come back.
from the App Store. Then, I opened the app and logged in with my Flow ID. I activated my Flow ID earlier for free at flowid.co. I clicked on the account number and watched the magic begin. All my bills and the info right there at my fingertips. Just confirm the payment amount, then card details, and that's it. No trips to town, no long lines, and no hassle. Flow is keeping me connected. There is nothing good about you. I don't want to be here. My father told me that as far as he was concerned, I could stay in the home forever. Our children deserve a chance for change. Children make mistakes, and child justice reform can help everyone to address these mistakes appropriately. Instead of sending a child to adult prison, let us give them alternative sentencing. We must divert our children from the court system through a holistic and systematic approach to addressing their offense and their road to rehabilitation. Rehabilitation helps child offenders to grow, change, learn from mistakes, accept responsibility, and make better choices. Reintegration of child offenders into the community after rehabilitation benefits the child, the family, and the community with a more productive citizen. Join the movement to give our children a chance for change. This message is brought to you by the USAID OECS Juvenile Justice Reform Project 2, funded by the United States Agency for International Development. For more information, log on to oecs.org forward slash JJRP. And we're moving now to news on the regional scene. Brazil has vaccinated more than 1 million people, but that is less than half of 1% of the population. And cities like Manaus, the gateway to the Amazon rainforest, still face a shortage of oxygen in hospitals. Corruption scandals are also hampering the vaccine rollout. Al Jazeera's Monica Yannickev reports. A new batch of vaccines has arrived in Manaus, and inoculations have resumed after being suspended for a week. The vaccination program came under scrutiny after local authorities were accused of favoring themselves and friends by skipping the line and taking shots ahead of health workers and the elderly. Two field hospitals have been set up in Manaus where patients must wait for a room. We're swamped. Field hospitals should help us redistribute patients. But this, the largest city in the Brazilian Amazon, still faces a shortage of oxygen, and health workers have been working around the clock to keep patients from suffocating to death. Like many, Valceni Ferreira's aunt didn't make it. You ask a nurse to help you, and she says she can't do anything, because she's dealing with another patient who is dying right in front of you. There aren't enough healthcare workers to deal with this. We wouldn't be in this situation if the Amazonas state had invested in healthcare. Where did all the money go? The health minister, Eduardo Pazuello, visited Manaus this week for the second time. He's also being investigated for allegedly mishandling the crisis. We had a big increase in the number of infections in early January, tripling the number of infected people. This was a completely unknown situation to everyone. And then there is the new variant of the coronavirus, discovered in Manaus, and much more contagious than the first. It has already spread to São Paulo, Brazil's richest city. As a result, countries like the United States, Portugal, Peru and Colombia are restricting flights to and from Brazil. For a period of 30 days, passenger flights from Colombia to Brazil 
and Brazil to Colombia will be suspended. Brazil has the largest COVID-19 death toll after the United States. But according to a study by Australia's Lowy Institute, comparing how 98 countries have dealt with the pandemic, Brazil is considered the worst. It's at the bottom of the list, right after Mexico, Colombia, Iran and the U.S. China was not included due to a lack of data. Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, has always downplayed the virus and even questioned the value of vaccines. He has also asked governors and mayors to avoid lockdowns. Think twice about restrictive policies. You must understand that isolation, lockdown and confinement leads to destitution. I've always said that the economy walks hand in hand with life. São Paulo and Manaus have just imposed new restriction measures. But in Rio de Janeiro, where the number of infections is also growing, beaches are crowded and social distancing seems to be a thing of the past. Monica Yanakiev, Al Jazeera, Rio de Janeiro. In Jamaica, the St. Anne Police Division is reporting a slight increase in reports of rape since the start of the year. This as news highlighting the incidence of abduction in the parish is circulated on social media. This disturbing trend has sparked outrage among residents and public officials. More in the CVM News Report. 28 days into the new year and already there have been five reports of rape in St. Anne. That's according to the head of the St. Anne Police, Superintendent Dwight Powell. He says, of the five cases of rape, three occurred in the Ocherias Police area one in Claremont and one in Monique. He says there's been a slight increase in rape compared to the same period last year. Unfortunately, no one has yet been taken into custody in relation to the most recent incidents. Superintendent Powell says an incident being circulated on social media involving one woman who was abducted in Ocherius recently may have stirred public apprehension. We are only up on record five such reports. So we are advising the public that if there's any other reports that may be out there that the police is not aware of, we are advising that they come in, make reports so that we can properly treat with them. He's strongly urging young women venturing into public spaces to be vigilant. The Jamaica Labour Party councillor for the Ocherius Division, Michael Bill Navis, says the municipality is disturbed by the spate of abductions in the town, which in some instances have included rape. It's a horrible situation. One was actually brutally raped. Fortunately, she was returned. But it is something that's very unusual in this area. And we're, making a, uh, we're crying on the authorities to see if they can you know, uh, be more vigilant and try and assist um, in this situation. Like Superintendent Powell, Bill Navis is urging young women to refrain from constantly using their cell phones in public. He is reminding residents to be vigilant, to provide assistance when these incidents occur. It is alleged most of the incidents involve taxi operators. He is therefore cautioning the public to travel only in red plate taxis and with the drivers they are familiar with. Aladdin Love for CVM Live. Coming up, Chile's food grows impacted by rumor. We'll tell you more when we come back. Imagine having the luxury of putting all your trust in one insurance company and being able to enjoy a life to the fullest without having to worry. Well, don't imagine. National Caribbean Insurance is here to take care of all your insurance needs. Insure your life, vehicle, boat, home, belongings, and your future. At NCI, we make it our business to ensure that you enjoy every stage in life. We serve, we protect, we satisfy. That's NCI. Welcome back. Exports of cherries from Chile to China have taken a hit, and it appears to be all because of a rumor. Unsubstantiated reports began circulating on Chinese social media that traces of COVID-19 were found in some boxes. Al Jazeera's Latin American editor, Lucia Newman, reports. All year long, producers wait for this moment, when their cherries go through the final stage of selection, sanitation, and packing 
before being shipped off to China. For the Chinese, this color, red, brings good fortune. So they import cherries, mainly from Chile, to celebrate the Chinese New Year, which starts next month. But when an unsubstantiated story went viral on Chinese social networks last week, it brought misfortune to Chile's multi-billion dollar cherry industry. Esto es una información no oficial. This was the result of non-official information in China, a rumor that's provoked a steep drop in demand, that our government is working round the clock with the private sector to see what we can do. When claims began circulating that some imported cherries had been found to be tainted with COVID-19, overnight exports plummeted from 500 to zero containers a day. Australian cherry producers have also been impacted, but not nearly as much as in Chile, which exports much larger quantities. No es una cuestión. We have never been formally accused of anything by Chinese sanitary or customs authorities. It's just a story in the media that was never retracted. The ones who suffer most are the small and medium-sized producers who have invested everything they have and went into debt betting, betting on a good year. The president of the Exporters Association says exports are picking up but that the cherries are being sold at a loss. And time is running out. It's summertime in the Southern Hemisphere, which makes these cherries particularly valuable because they are picked, packed, and shipped at a strategic time for the Chinese market. But unlike these grapes, these cherries will spoil in just a matter of weeks. Chile has launched an intense counteroffensive in China, using influencers and scientists on social networks to try to convince consumers that their cherries are safe to eat. All this is more than just bad luck. It underscores just how vulnerable fruit exporters are to a negative tweet or story, substantiated or not. Lucia Newman, Al Jazeera, Santiago. For years, experts... Ec for years, efforts to clean up contaminated communities in Nigeria's oil-rich Niger Delta have been bogged down in dispute and bureaucracy. In 2011, the United Nations Environment Program proposed the creation of a $1 billion fund to repair the damage done by decades of oil spills in the area. But activists say they are not impressed with the piece of work. Al Jazeera's Ahmed Idris reports. Workers agitate a riverbed to flush out trapped oil in Bodo Creek. As the oil comes to the surface, a boom traps the sludge for evacuation. It's a job the contractors hired by oil giant Shell must quickly accomplish before the tide returns. The cleanup is due to litigation against the company following a massive oil spill in Ogoni in 2009. The scope of this work is to remediate uh, the polluted areas in Bodo Creek and uh, after that, the next phase will be the restoration, revegetation of the mangroves and the monitoring. So far, it's a 1,000 hectares. While Shell and its contractors say they've done a lot to some sites, the Nigerian government-led decontamination effort jointly funded by the Shell company is off to a slow start. Heavy machinery is now deployed further inland to excavate and treat contaminated soil. We are not on target from what we had planned, but we're trying to see what we can do to catch up. There's still a lot of work to do to catch up and meet our target. An assessment by the United Nations Environment Program, first published in 2011, shows that pollution from more than half a century of oil production was worse than originally thought. The report recommended a $1 billion fund to clean up Ogoni alone, an area covering 1,000 square kilometers. The work, which began six years later, could take at least 25 years to complete. Much of Ogoni is a wasteland. This mangrove is dead as fish and crustaceans no longer spawn here. Farmlands, fish ponds, and even underground water supplies have been polluted by hydrocarbons leaking from old pipelines. We could expect Some activists in the region are less impressed with the work so far. Other communities in the Niger Delta felt that if it works, for the Ogoni people, then there is hope for other communities in the Niger Delta because the Ogoni case is just one case out of several, several communities in the Niger Delta. And how many years down the line we are not getting it right in Ogoni? 
And that's not the only concern. Significant amount of oil theft continues in the region, further complicating the process of reversing the environmental damage. Experts believe 15 to 20,000 square kilometers more of Nigeria's oil producing region require the attention Ogoni is currently receiving. They fear that unless the entire region is decontaminated, Ogoni's cleanup may in the end be a waste of time and resources as recontamination could occur. Ahmed Idris, Al Jazeera, Ogoni in Nigeria's oil producing Niger Delta. Up next in sports, ASTJ Hawks and Dynamic Ballers defeat their opponents in the Under-20 Junior Basketball League. And Djokovic and Serena enjoy freedom after quarantine. Stay with us. Imagine having the luxury of putting all your trust in one insurance company and being able to enjoy a life to the fullest without having to worry. Well, don't imagine. National Caribbean Insurance is here to take care of all your insurance needs. Insure your life, vehicle, boat, home, belongings, and your future. At NCI, we make it our business to ensure that you enjoy every stage in life. We serve, we protect, we satisfy. That's NCI. First up in sports, the Under-20 Junior Basketball League continued at Basketball City on Thursday with two games. In the first game, ASC Jayhawks defeated Rams Futa Falcons 84-83. In overtime, Jayhawks was led by Makimbo Fai with 22 points and 11 rebounds. He was assisted by Trent James, 20 points, 17 rebounds, 3 blocks, and Zendai Richards, 18 points. For Falcons, Amir Gums, 27 points, 5 assists, 3 steals. Jaquante Fraser, 19 points, 16 rebounds, 2 assists. Garfield Hodge, 24 points, 3 assists, and 2 steals. In the second game, Dynamic Ballers outplayed Rams hitters, defeating them 80-57. to Ballers was led by Kijari Huggins, 23 points, 6 rebounds, 5 steals, 2 assists. Nicolan Lybird, 16 points, 5 steals, 3 rebounds. Julian Emilian, 14 points, 3 rebounds, 3 assists, 3 steals. For hitters, for hitters Jalen Sadler, 23 points, 12 rebounds, 2 steals. Tyreek Jeffers, 8 points, 9 rebounds, 5 assists. Saeed Richardson, 5 points. After 14 days of quarantine, the world's top tennis players have been enjoying some freedom in the run-up to the Australian Open. 
and a few of them have been back out on the court playing in front of fans for the first time in a year. Al Jazeera's David Stokes reports. After two weeks, largely confined to their hotel rooms, it was no surprise to see Novak Djokovic and Serena Williams taking a stroll outside in the Adelaide sun. Unlike more than 70 of their fellow pros in full lockdown in Melbourne, they have at least been able to train for five hours a day. But still, they're glad it's over. Putting bare feet on the ground, you know, just doing something that I didn't have a chance to do. So, you know, just, just having the, the space, I think that's what we all kind of missed. For Williams, she's been quarantining with her three-year-old daughter, Alexis, and they marked their release with a trip to the zoo. We had a calendar in our room, and every day we marked an X on the days that went by, and a big circle on the quarantine ending day, and we promised her that we would take her to the zoo to see koalas and, um, and uh, kangaroos. The players then headed across town to play in an exhibition tournament where 4,000 fans were allowed in to watch. But minutes before he was due on court, Djokovic pulled out of his match because of blisters on his hand. Not what the crowd wanted to hear. But his practice partner, Filip Krajanovic, stepped in and took the opening set against Yannick Sinner. Only for Djokovic to then make a U-turn and make an appearance after all. Please welcome onto the court the world number one, Novak Djokovic. Despite the blister on his right hand, the Serb produced some trademark shots to secure the victory. I'm sorry that I didn't step in on the court from the beginning. Um, I, I, I had, to, had to do some treatment with my physio and uh, wasn't feeling my best uh, in the last couple of days. Game, set match, Williams. Serena's trip to the zoo clearly did the trick. She won her match against Naomi Osaka with both players enjoying performing in front of a live audience again. We haven't played in front of a crowd in over a year, so it's been a really long time. Um, so this is really cool, and then for having us and trusting us with your, with your laws was great, and we were so happy just to be here, and now it's worth it. Just really, thanks for coming out. I haven't seen people, and it feels like forever, so um, just to play in front of you guys is really amazing. Meanwhile in Melbourne, the process to release players from full lockdown continues. Because of COVID-19 cases on their flights, they've been confined to their rooms for 14 days or more and unable to train. Sure to be at a huge disadvantage when the Australian Open begins in 10 days' time. David Stokes, Al Jazeera. And that's it for sports. When we come back, we'll have another look at the stories that made the headlines. To avoid getting the coronavirus, remember to wash your hands thoroughly and frequently before and after preparing food, after using the toilet or changing a diaper baby, sick person or the elderly, after blowing your nose and after leaving large gatherings or moving away from persons who appear ill. Encourage others to wash their hands and also use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer of 60 to 70 percent solution. Stay away from events having large gatherings of people. You can expose yourself to more possible infections in large groups. Also, avoid sharing cutlery, cups, glassware, etc. with others. Viruses can linger on these items and may be transferred this way. Avoid shaking and holding hands, and hugging or keeping an infected person in close proximity. This is a message from the Ministry of Health and the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA. And we're wrapping up with a recap of the top stories. Sir Kennedy pays tribute to the late Cicely Tyson. Public Works official explains rationale behind cutting up sections of the road and cabinet hears plans for COVID-19 training at the JNF hospital. And that's the end of the ZSZ Channel 5 newscast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carla Barrage. Goodbye.